Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Jean-Christophe Therion, and I'm an associate professor at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Ishikawa, Japan. And I would also like to introduce to you my new um, collaborator in this new project I have initiated, Mr. Mark Elwell. And today I would like to talk to you about Thomas Kuhn, Gaston Bachelard, and Mitsuo Taketani, three different approaches to scientific change and progress. So the theme of this conference is Bonfire of the Paradigms. So I slightly modified my presentation in, in, in order to suit the theme of the conference. So actually, um, we could start by being a little bit nasty and say, okay, uh, which representatives of the current paradigm are we going to burn first? So we could talk about uh, Wang Hu Suk, um, accused of fraud, actually accepted as fraud, Okay, so let's put him in the fire here. <laughs> um, then we could um, look at um, Richard Dawkins. Why, why Richard Dawkins? Okay, for becoming a guru, maybe. Okay, uh, oop, he disappeared. And then, okay, Cyril Bird, okay, accused of fraud. Okay, well, this one got into the fire. Okay, so let's look at the roots of the problem. We're starting a fire from the foundations, aren't we? So, as it is used here, what does paradigm refer to? Okay, uh, we need to consider here the framework of the conventional current practice of science. So, let's look here at science trademark here as an institution. And let's look at some of the main elements <coughs> of science as an institution. So, we have the peer review system, we have famous institution which involve hierarchy, publications, we have established authority, and reliance on government-funded uh, grants. So for example, here you have an image of a monolith. I think that works a lot, that says a lot of words. Um, and let's look first at a few examples uh, with the peer review system. Um, first of all, the Piltdown Man, fabrication of physical evidence. So Cyril Burt, fabrication of data, maybe fabrication of researcher. Wang Hu Suk, fraud. The, Schoen, the recent Schoen scandal in Germany. Um, fabrication of data as well. So there is a problem here. Okay, let's go back to paradigm. Where does the word paradigm come into the discussion? This term, as most of you know, is, was coined by Thomas Kuhn, a okay, very famous American philosopher of science. Okay? In his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which he published in 1962. But Kuhn also used a, t a more technical term. He used the term disciplinary matrix as well. Okay? Um, let's tr define our terms before we continue. What is the etymology of paradigm? Well, if you look at Plato, paradigma, to show side by side, pattern, or comparison. Another meaning would be example, to show from example, in grammar, for example. Um, in his book, actually, there are at least 22 different uses of the term paradigm. There are two main meanings which we are going to retain here that have been officially recognized by Kuhn later. Okay? The first meaning would be body or collection of values and techniques that are shared by a group of scientists. The second one would be the manner in which a person who is trained in a given field learns to recognize the element of entities in the first definition, to isolate them and to distinguish them from each other. Okay? If we look at the first definition, what a paradigm does is to specify the correct way of formulating and solving problems. And actually, some elements of a paradigm would include mathematical language, so mathematical generalizations, frequently metaphors such as the hydraulic metaphor in electricity, verbal explanation of a given phenomenon, diagrams, drawings, models, for example, the Bohr model, you have them. Okay. And uh, here also, uh, within that first definition, what we're looking at, what we're considering, is technology by which the work is done, but also looking at the human side, attitudes, expectation, belief, practices. Okay. Uh, if we look at the second definition rec recognized by Kuhn, we're looking at the practical phase of a scientist training. Okay, that is going from theory to practice by meditating <coughs> on example. Uh, an example I've thought about here is, for example, in electricity. Okay, finding the electric field by considering different geometries, so going from one geometry to another. Okay. Um, one specific component of a paradigm or disciplinary matrix would be the consensus on exemplars of good science. 
which you typically find in books and papers. For example, Aristotle's analysis of motion, um, Lavoisier's application of the balance in chemistry, Maxwell's mathematization of the electromagnetic field. But actually, great texts are also paradigms in themselves, containing theories and laws. Okay. Um, other models apart from Kuhn's are the epistemological model developed by Gaston Bachelard in France, and the phenomen phenomenological model developed by Mitsuo Taketani um, already before World War II uh, in Japan, in Kyoto, I believe. So let's talk a little bit about Mitsuo Taketani's model. In 1936, he developed the so-called doctrine of the three stages of scientific development based on Hegelian dialectic. Uh, it it um, contains the phenomenal, the substantial, and the essential stages. So you start with the phenomenal stages, observation of regularities and phenomena, and then you go to the substantial uh, stage looking at entities okay, that are related to those observations, and finally the essence connecting entities and phenomena. So corresponding to this triad, we have three stages of scientific development. Okay? One case example would be Newtonian astronomy where you observe celestial bodies, uh, phenomenal stage, you hypothesize real constituent in the universe, substantial stage, and in the essential stage, uh, you der derive some mathematical laws okay, to explain uh, the motions of the bodies. Um, this image uh, has been taken from a presentation by Soshichi Uchi, emeritus professor of philosophy of science at Kyoto University. Okay. But actually, according at least to Uchi sensei uh, Mitsuo Taketani's model has some problems. Okay. I won't go into details here, but first of all, what is the criterion for distinguishing the three stages? You notice also that the, the process repeats itself, in, like in a spiral. Okay? So what would be the logic for repeating the substantial and essential stages at a higher level? For example, going uh, from Newtonian mechanics to Einstein's theory of general relativity. So there are some problems with this model, at least as articulated by uh, Uchi Sense. Um, let's look very quickly at Gaston Bachelard's model of scientific change. So it is based on epistemological concepts. And it predates, actually, Kuhn's work by more than 20 years. Okay? Actually, Kuhn was indirectly influenced by Bachelard via the French philosopher Alexandre Coiré as well. According to uh, Bachelard, science is best known by reflection on its history. So history of science is important to understand science. Bachelard believed that there are some sharp breaks in the history of science. Okay? Um, in his model of scientific change and progress, there are five key epistemological concepts epistemological break, obstacle, profile, act, and reforging, refonte in French. Okay, so very quickly, let's go through, the, uh, through a few of those, I mean, all of those. Uh, if we look at the epistemological break, there are two types, a break or even a contradiction between scientific knowledge and ordinary knowledge based on common sense experiences, uh, a break between successive scientific concepts, if we look at an ep epistemological obstacle, we're looking at, at any concept or method that prevents a break from occurring. Common sense can be an ep epistemological obstacle. Implicit views and attitudes, unconscious st structures of thought, images such as, once again, Bohr's model, for example. They may have been useful in the past, but not anymore. Epistemological profile would be an analysis of a given individual's understanding of a scientific concept. An epistemological act would actually be a leap of genius okay, by some scientists, which would lead to scientific progress. An epistemological reforging would be a preservation by a reformulation of old ideas in a new and broader context of thought. For example, including Euclidean geometry into non-Euclidean geometry as a special case, or Newtonian mechanics as a special case, but not rejected uh, of Einstein's relativistic mechanics. In other words, we're looking at a rectification of errors. Okay? So owing to problems inherent in Taketani's model, we will focus on Kuhn versus Bachelard. So here, I know it's a busy uh, table uh, to compare Kuhn and Bachelard, so I will emphasize, I will highlight the main points, the similarities in yellow and the differences in red. So both of them who were actually trained as physicists before they became philosophers of science, okay? Um, I myself, I'm a physicist, and just now I'm getting into philosophy of science. It's very interesting. Um, anyway, history of science was very important to both of them. Okay? 
Whereas Kuhn focuses on scientific theory, Gaston Bachelard focuses on epistemological concept. And if we look at a description of scientific change, uh, to Bach for, for Kuhn, um, normal science was constituted by paradigms like puzzles. You, you add pieces to the puzzle. And when there is a piece that you would like to add that doesn't fit with the puzzle, okay, then you have a crisis, which leads to scientific revolution, in other words, to paradigm shift. According to Kuhn, those are rare and they are discontinuous, whereas for uh, Bachelard, um, there is the historical discontinuity is normal. Okay? The mode of change in the case of Kuhn is that those crises constitute a sudden event, whereas actually in the case of Bachelard, there is a process that is involved. Is there scientific progress? In the case of Kuhn, not necessarily, because there is so-called Kuhn loss, okay? a loss of explanatory power that can occur when you have a new theory. Okay? Uh, in the case of Bachelard, usually, yes, there will be uh, scientific progress. Is there a better approximation to the truth? When I say the truth here, I mean something that is objectively measurable. Okay? Uh, no, according to Kuhn, because of the incommensurability, the difficulty in comparing successive theories. In the case of Bachelard, yes, through the correction of error. So you can see that um, there is an interesting mix of similarities and differences between Kuhn and Bachelard. So this is the question I would like to submit to all of you in this conference. Can we elaborate a new model from Kuhn and Bachelard that will address real problems? Okay, this is what I would like to start working on in my new project. In other words, are we just burning the old house, science as an institution today? Or are we preparing the ground for planting a new crop? So in building a new model, we need a metric. And of course, we, we're planning to use anomalies and the metric, and I know that there are famous experts here on anomalies. I'm just um, a rookie in that field, um, but I hope to do some interesting work on it. Um, as we know, there are well-known anomalies in the history of science that led to scientific progress. One of the best examples can be found in astronomy. For example, the anomalous orbit of Uranus, leading to the discovery of Neptune by Le Verrier and Adams in 1846. The anomalous uh, angular advance of the perihelion of Mercury's orbit around the Sun, which was finally explained via um, relativist Einstein theory of general relativity. Those are quite well-known examples. But we can look at anomalies in so-called fringe science. So what is originally considered as fringe science could be now, is, that is now part of current paradigms, would include continental drift, Wegener's theory, okay? Big Bang theory by Abbé Lemaitre, heliocentrism, existence of Troy, Norse colonization of the Americas, etc. okay? Anomalies that might soon be accepted as science uh, that would constitute right now non-science in Popperian terms, okay, or our pseudoscience. Uh, the LA effect, maybe, cold fusion, crop circles, cryptozoology, energy healing, human longevity, UFO phenomenon, etc. So actually, why is French science with its accompanying anomalies rejected? So the current paradigms tend to become more of an obstacle to than a facilitator of scientific progress because there are some inherent problems that might be an accidental consequence of former technology. Okay, we are going back to the list of, um, of elements that constitute um, a, a, a paradigm um, in the um, conventional view of science as an institution. Okay, peer review system might lead to a mafia. Self-referential, for example, okay, uh, confirmation bias, that there are all those can lead to problems with peer review system. Institution, hierarchy, and publication, okay, here the argument from authority plays an important role. Government-dominated funding leads to a politicization of science. Technology, um, actually using paper, what I call here the paper priesthood, okay, can lead to inertia. It takes quite a while in order to publish a uh, publication in uh, paper format whereas by using the internet, it can be done much more quickly. The concluding remark I would like to make here is technology has changed, okay? From the time of the monastery and the paper text uh, to the printing press uh, until now, uh, in the internet age, okay, involving digital media, uh, there has been a tremendous advance in technology that we need to consider when building our new model, okay? And actually, we would like to hypothesize that the sharing of knowledge via distributed systems, 
needs to be integrated this to, into this new model of scientific change and progress. So I'm giving you here as a few examples, SETI at Home, which was started some 15 years ago, I believe, um, distributed.net, amateur astronomy. In other words, we believe that we would need a Protestant, okay, par, per, by analogy with, uh, with um, what uh, happened um, uh, you know, in, the six, in 16th century Europe, a uh, reformation of science in which every, every person becomes a scientist. Can everybody become a scientist? In principle, potentially, yes. Young people nowadays have tools which we would not even have dreamt about 50 years ago. Okay? Uh, those tools can really be used so that everybody can become um, a scientist. And especially um, the possibility of serendipitous discovery can be tremendously magnified, uh, we believe. Okay? Um, I would like to thank you for your attention. I know that my presentation was a bit short, so I suspect that there might be quite a lot of questions. And uh, if there is anything more you would like to discuss with me in detail, of course, I will be available after at the, at the conference. Thank you very much. All right, terrific. We do have plenty of time for questions. I'd like to point out that uh, one of your uh, fringe sciences, at least on your list, uh, sort of jumped out as not really fitting with the others because it's it's caught in a cleft stick and no reformulation or paradigm shift will fix the problem as it's currently defined, and that is cryptozoology. Cryptozoologists are people who try to establish the existence of animals that are reported but are not yet known to be real. Uh, whenever they succeed, it stops being part of their subject matter, and the regular biologists take over. That is a structural problem inherent to that science, uh, which uh, I, I, I couldn't think of a way for them to get out of it, but if, if it doesn't matter what the rest of the scientific paradigm does, they have to fix their own definition in order to become part of a, a unified, successful scientific system. I thank you very much for pointing out this, uh, this problem. Uh, I, th I think the um, idea of uh, viewing progress in science and change in science in terms of a break, uh, it implies that science can be described as a one-dimensional thing or as one aspect, whereas I think actually there are three important aspects of science. There is the theory, and that's what the paradigms refer to. There are methods, and there are phenomena and facts. And I believe that those three aspects of science don't change in lockstep. One changes, then another one, then another one. And I found a useful way of thinking uh, about change is that uh, if you're trying to, if you're claiming a change in one aspect of science, then Kuhn's idea of paradigm shifts and scientific revolutions re, uh, applies. If, however, you try to change a mainstream consensus with two of the aspects at the same time, uh, you have no audience effectively and uh, a classic example of that is uh, Mendel, um, who uh, was ignored essentially for 50 years because he was using an unorthodox method and producing unorthodox data. And if you try to suggest the changes needed in theory, method, and facts all at the same time, then you have things like uh, Loch Ness monsters, Velikovsky's ideas, and what is generally thought of as dismissed as pseudoscience. Thank you very much for your, for your comments. It's going to be very helpful. I would like to uh, make a comment that the science that we have been discussing in this room is primarily dominated by modern science that originated in the West. There were some talks uh, that
There's another science about which people don't know anything because of poor dissemination, and that's the ancient science of non-duality that originated thousands of years ago. Ayurveda has come to, or coming to US and the West. Acupuncture is here. And also the science of yoga, not uh, the yoga that you see on the street, but the deep science. Mm -hmm. So one proposal, one thought is that in this society, we can entertain the idea, what is their science? There have been discussions here in this uh, uh, conference since morning. There are many concepts that can be put forward, definitions, uh, terminology, on and on. But these science, even the terminology, for example, there is no standardization. And I'm speaking to you from my own experience. Mm -hmm. I think it will be a very fruitful exercise to find the interface between these two sciences, mm -hmm. the ancient and the modern. And you will see a lot of mm -hmm. cross, um, yeah. uh, cross current yeah. to help the humanity mm -hmm. move forward. Mm -hmm. Actually, Bachelard talked about region of, uh, regions of rationality. And that implied also regions of science, not only field, but I think he, also, he might also have uh, implied also geographically as well. And uh, actually, in, in the course of uh, philosophy and history of science, I have been teaching at JAIST, actually the first that is being given in English. Um, when we look at the history of science, I do not start with the Greek. I look at Indian science. I also look at Chinese science, and even a little bit of Japanese science. Well. Wasan, for example, mathematics in the 17th century, uh, the way, for example, that um, uh, calculus was also seemingly independent, independently formalized by, uh, by Seki Takakazu in Japan uh, as well. So I totally uh, ag agree with you. And actually, in my research, I would like to consider all those different um, regions of rationalities and regions of science uh, in, in my model. I'll be happy to give you some uh, key references. Uh, as a way to initiate a dialogue with you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Okay, thank you.